Hello, my name is KJ Jennings, and I'm the president of the Association of Film Commissions International. And I'd like to welcome you to the panel, which is how film commissions shape creative industry policy at South by Southwest 2021. And with me on the panel, we have Bob Rains from the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Stephanie Whalen from the Texas Film Commission, and Tava Sosky from the Oklahoma Film and Music Office. Um, one of the key questions is what does a film commission do? And we're really fortunate today to have three of the leading film commissioners in the world to give us their perspectives on what they do day to day and how they shape policy in the long term. Um, I would just like to welcome you all and any introductory hellos. Um, I'll jump in first. Um, Hello, I'm Stephanie Whalen. I'm the director of the Texas Film Commission. Uh, we're so excited to be here at South by Southwest 2021. Woohoo! We made it. Um, what our film commission does, which is gonna, you'll hear uh, slightly different variations from my colleagues. We are a, a state agency. We're part of the Office of the Governor's Economic Development and Tourism Division. And um, we are tasked with marketing Texas as a media production destination. And that is um, a, a, a large task and we do that in many different ways. We administer programs, uh, much like our Film Friendly Texas program, our incentive program, our media production development zone program, and we offer a variety of other resources, including a statewide locations database, a job hotline, a production directory, and I know I'm forgetting a lot of other things. So any on any given day, we are liaising with projects that are interested in coming to the state to film. We're working with our local creative industry folks to find out what their needs and are in terms of the work that they're currently doing in state. And we're we're, we're working with our legislators and um, our community partners to understand how production can benefit um, their jurisdictions and their communities. So there's a lot and it, it's never boring, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think we'll find there's a lot of overlap with what our different commissions do. And um, one of the unique things that for people new to the world of film commissions is that we don't charge for our services. So mm -hmm. we are your trusted resource in the whichever market you wanna go to, to help you begin the process, do your process and follow up. So um, yeah. there is there is differences between commissions. Um, we're dealing today with three state commissions uh, and there might be smaller ones. We have 300 members in the AFCI. Um, but we, we find that there's this, although there's commonality, there's difference in how you uh, perform within your own state. And so uh, based on what Stephanie had just said, do either of you want to um, sort of update differences you might have or similarities? Sure, uh, I can I can jump in. I mean, I love what Stephanie said. Uh, we're, we're busy, we're active, and um, every day's different. There's no two days alike, um, which is very similar to filmmaking, actually, uh, which is what, you know, I did um, in my professional career before out in Los Angeles before moving back to my home state, which is Oklahoma. So I'm Tava Malojsovsky, the uh, director here at the Oklahoma Film and Music Office, and we are based in Oklahoma City, uh, which is our state's capital. Um, we also have two um, other film commissions. We have the first tribal film office, the Cherokee Nation Film Office based in Tahlequah and Tulsa, as well as a city film commission, the Tulsa Film Office of Music, Arts and Culture. So for such a small but mighty dynamic state uh, here in Oklahoma, centrally located, we do have two um, additional local film uh, commissions. And like Stephanie in Texas, we also have a very robust, we've just rebooted a film friendly community certification program to, and our goal is to, we're working hard to certify all 77 counties so that when productions are coming in, that the, the communities are better equipped to serve their needs better. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's all about education. So that is one of our big goals, of course, um, internally is like Stephanie is uh, just informing and educating 
uh, our administration, the lawmakers, um, you know, business leaders, spectators, that's our job. If, if we don't tell them what the film industry looks like and what um, wonderful work and pivotal work we're doing, then they're not gonna know. And so we, we do a lot of educating. Um, and so that is, that is very important. Uh, we also work really hard internally to cultivate our local talent, to, um, to listen, have an ear to the ground at all times to our vendors, our you know soundstage facilities, to the filmmakers themselves and musicians, et cetera, all the, the professionals working in the industry. And then we also promote our and, and administer a uh, rebate program, which is the cash rebate program here in Oklahoma. I'm sure we'll touch on later. That's a big job. It takes a lot of time. And uh, we're very proud to have that program uh, preserved and growing. Um, from year to year. And then we also have like most of the state uh, and global film commissions, we have multiple directories through Real Scout. So we've got the production directory, uh, we have a music directory, as well as locations directory with thousands and thousands of locations. So we're the, we're the go-to, we're the one-stop shop. And really um, our goal is to set the stage for our local uh, industry and communities to shine and show their work tell their stories. Thanks, David. Uh, Bob, would you like to give us a brief update yeah. on how you're similar and dissimilar in Tennessee? Well, KJ, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be talking with uh, the folks um, out there. And, you know, my colleagues from Texas and Oklahoma, I think they did a great job in really framing up what we do, you know, as commissions in the, in the creative world. I think what I will say, just to sort of encompass that a little bit, is that you know, we are uh, missioned with really increasing high quality jobs. I mean, that's what in the end, you know, we do. It's high quality jobs. And and I think that we are here to diversify our economic landscape. And, um, you know, having coming from a state that that has a creative class, it's really, really important to, you know, showcase that, um, you know, we have this great diverse landscape that adds to just the larger economic impact um, of our state. I think also we provide these unique convergence points um, uh, for the for the industry. You know, we're we're all a bit of a clearinghouse, um, and you can imagine all the people that come through our doors every day. I mean, we talk with people from film and music. We talk with people from video gaming, um, and it's just a it's a it's a great clearinghouse where you know if you're looking to be in the creative industry, um, you're wanting to understand what a stage create creative energy um, you know industry is like and be in that flow. Um, you know, I think state commissions are a great uh, resource. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the great things is because you're there for economic development and growing the entire industry, you are a safe person for people to talk to about private projects, mm -hmm. what they want to do in career development, which is not always available to people in our industries um, because it's a very, you know, it's independent driven. Uh, it makes it difficult for people to trust reach out to someone they can trust. And I think that's one of the things that film commissions provide is confidentiality and a trusted ear and a network of connections that you're freely giving, um, which is a great asset for anybody either established or coming into the industry. Yeah, um, we always say we do a lot of facilitating. Like we do a yeah. lot of introduc introductions and mm -hmm. sharing of information. Connecting yeah. the, the dots. Yeah, yeah. Connecting all the dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and people mightn't realize that often a film commission is involved way before a project might happen, where somebody might be looking somewhere, whether it be New York, LA, or wherever, looking for a place to do their project, that you guys will provide images and locations and help them realize that they can do business in your place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we've done packages already, locations packages for writers looking for research. Mm. We, we do that for video games a lot as well when they're looking for sort of like, um, you know, images to sort of start building their background world. Um, we'll do that. So um, I liked what Bob said. We are the clearinghouse and the intersection yeah. point for someone. Yeah. We're also yeah, good for I, I budgeting. Like to say that, so, yeah, you know, if, yeah. if you have when you have people coming to your state, they want to know what your state cost over another state. We're also a mm -hmm. great place to, to come to because, you know, they're able to come in, get their budget down, you know, see where it's cost effective, where it's not cost effective at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that provides a perfect segue into talking about sort of expanding the role of film commissions beyond the traditional film industry. And I know for most of our members, it used to be basically feature films, TV series, and television commercials. But the world's changing. And I know that your three offices are really at the forefront of kind of embracing that. Um, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll just start with you, Bob, is that um, the music scene and the way you've been able to leverage that and capitalize on that and then build the music industry is quite beyond the tra uh, traditional role of what a film commission used to be. So would you like to tell us a bit about how that's gone? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think just sort of stepping back, I think, you know, up to about 10 years ago, yeah, a lot of what we did was film. It was, it was very production oriented. Um, and, you know, what shifted, at least from my purview, is that we ended up seeing more talent migration to our state. There was disruption in technology happening. Um, state incentives came on. And then there was alignment with economic development or commerce departments. We started seeing a lot of our commissions going in that way. And so, um, you know, I, I think where we were, you know, because film and TV was not necessarily a traditional manufacturing, you know, jobs, um, at least, you know, on, on from, from my point of view, you know, we were struggling with these full time job equivalents. Um, and these metrics that were established by the Department of Economic and Community Development. So I think strategically, we wanted to, you know, start to shift towards things that we had a competitive advantage in. I mean, obviously, film and television is something that we primarily do. But, you know, what we wanted to start doing is seeing, well, where and what areas can we start to expand out to where we have this competitive advantage? Um, or things that might have a better full-time job equivalency, because as a state, you're always looking to what's the return on investment to your state. And so when you're having to go to the taxpayers and explain to them why you need money, you have to be able to explain to them the return on investment. And so that's where we started shifting ourselves, you know, towards this music and even creative um, technology, because, you know, what we saw is music was one of those things that, again, it was here. We had people working. We had companies, distributors here. Um, it was it was easy for us to have a competitive advantage and bring more people into what I call the economic cluster and build that economic cluster here in the state. And so that was a pretty easy one. And then the, the creative technology was, and this is something Texas was doing long before us, is that it created these long term, high quality jobs that we wanted to be involved in. And so, again, that kept shifting us. Um, away from just sort of the novel production and saying, OK, we're just one thing. We are just film and television. Well, if you run a business, you want, you know, multiple services. And, um, and I think every commission is coming to this, you know, at this point is that we just don't do film and television. We do these multiple industry focuses and they all merge together. That's a great thing is that they all come together in some way. And they, you know, there's like I was talking about convergence points. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it just makes us for a healthy, more, more diverse landscape. Yeah, that's um, great. And, uh, Tava, I recall going to an event you put on at Sundance, which was an Oklahoma event at Sundance. And I was surprised at the amount of musicians that you had that arrived from, uh, your state and how intertwined you'd made them or they had become with your traditional film industry. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about how that? When? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And and I often find myself, it's, you know, saying it's not just film or TV or music, it's, it is entertainment. So Bob has, <laughs> has beat us in that race of, of just claiming it. It is entertainment. There's so much there. And I think Oklahoma has already a lot of great um, tech companies and that whole industry is building and um, so as we're growing, you know, originally being just the film commission, uh, 40 years of being a film commission, and then about a decade ago, um, which was before my time here at the office, but we we really just looked at our assets it, around the state. Um, and as Bob said, a lot of there was a lot of a lot of migration um, into Tennessee. So I um, I know a lot of Oklahomans are there now, but but we really looked internally at our assets and it was, you know, 
yes, a lot of wonderful music uh, artists have come out of Oklahoma. Some of some of the the big country stars are still living here. And, and doing some great things, but the rising talent, I mean, as we all have, all three have in our states, the, the growing talent is, is just, um, is just second to none. There's just, we have so much. And so we decided to, as the film office to uh, co-brand as the Oklahoma film and music office. And then also on top of the film incentive is, is, is incentivizing uh, filmmakers to utilize local musicians to record here, to license music that was recorded here. And so on top of their 35%, they would get a bonus of 2%. So typically film commissions will incentivize what's important to them. And so that is what we're currently doing. Um, the forecast looks good for even evolving that a little bit and, and incentivizing for, for some more workforce and infrastructure development. Um, incentives, but for now, you know, we really, we really have a lot to um, to tell the world and to show the world through both the filmmakers and music makers here in the state. And I think one thing that I've seen in my six years here is significant growth just in recording facilities. Um, you know, the uh, a, a couple of our recording facilities have now extended into post because the filmmakers are going into those studios and they're spending a lot of time, a lot of money. They're, they're seeing so much talent in Oklahoma, but then they're wanting to stay. And so we've actually seen some e expanded uh, recording facilities now also doing post-production. So just to what you, Bob and KJ were saying, they're so inter interwoven and there's so much synergy there. So with our long history uh, and uh, cultural assets with film and music. We're just, we're, we're, we're playing on those together. And um, in television, obviously being new in the digital streaming world, really open, swinging our gates open for, for those, for that new business as well. Great. Stephanie, I know you're, the Texas Film Commission is about to celebrate a birthday this year. Uh, we are. Um, 2021 marks our 50th anniversary. So we were, our office was created in 1971 by the current governor at, at the time. Um, not the current governor. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then we, we were started originally, like a lot of other film commissions, to generate and market ourselves to film production. But very early on, um, and as we're going back through our archives and sort of taking a trip back through memory lane um, this year, we're seeing just how sort of um, prescient some of this forethought thought was, is we've, um, for as long as I can remember, and even before, there has been a, an intentional inclusion of all the different creative media industries. Don't let our name fool you. Um, we, um, we serve film, TV, commercial, video games, AR, VR. Um, there's technologies that we don't even know are coming down the pike and we will most likely serve them. And that is some of those fun calls that I get on you know, a regular basis of like, we have this kind of project, let me tell you about it. So um, I'm always excited to hear what, what else is popping up, but um, yeah, especially as they were planning our um, incentive program, we have a grant um, program. Um, and even in the early beginnings of that program, digital media projects like games and web series and other things were taken into account. I don't think they could have predicted where streaming and all this other new AR, VR technology is taking us. but. Um, there are the bones of that, and I've always been very proud that we serve all these industries because, like my colleagues on this panel have said, it is all converging. And we find that, like, you know, we'll have animators working on games, and then they'll go to a TV series and back and forth. And, you know, we really have a rich crew base here in Texas that has been able to embrace all the different industry sectors. And that makes me really proud. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah the, the 50 years is sort of mind blowing that the work, this work has been done. And, um, you know, it's, it's been pretty great. But yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, because it seems like you you've had a time to evolve. You evolved because you've been mm -hmm. in existence for so long. And I think one of the things that Bob yeah. touched on earlier was we used to always try to have to convince our legislatures of politicians they all wanted to speak in full time employment. And the film industry might come in and shoot for six months or twelve months. It might bring fifty million dollars in a year, but it struggled to get into that full time employment thing. Um, but it sounds like one of the benefits that you guys are doing with reaching out into animation, video, digital media, is that now you're able to generate more of what traditional full-time jobs were and help to build bricks and mortar infrastructure. So I guess that would be something just to hear your guys' experience of how that's helped you shift your messaging to your legislators to help help them understand how valuable this industry is and how broad. Well, I mean, KJ, I think, you know, um, for us anyway, it's, you know, our rebranding, you know, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, one of the things that we wanted to do for the administration, for the legislature is to say, if you are the Department of Economic and Community Development, you are concentrated on auto manufacturing, you are concentrated on textiles, aerospace. And what we wanted to do is we want to change the narrative is that Entertainment is not sort of a island onto itself, but it is part of the sector, right? And that was sort of part of that narrative and branding. Optics is everything. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you do. Optics is 100% everything. And um, being able to go in and say, listen, entertainment is a sector onto itself, just like, you know, um, manufacturing, auto manufacturing, and you give incentives to that. Um, or you give incentives to chemical or textiles or whatever, then, you know, you should look at this in the same way. And so just being able to set that narrative up. So when we're talking with legislatures or talking to the administration, we're talking, you know, from a, um, you know, from a uh, economic sector point of view. Like I never say film or television. Uh, mm -hmm. I always say the entertainment sector. That's what I always brand everything I talk about to the governor um, you know, on down to any legislatures that we're in the entertainment sector and this is X and this is what X does um, and then sort of take them through the motions. And I find that to be a really great way to thread them away from what's in front of the camera. And that's Hollywood and sort of what they see in that small box and try to bring them sort of into a larger, broader conversation that we're able to really have about the economics of what the creative class brings to your state. And in the end, that's it. What does the creative class hold? And they're very unique and you want to hold on to them because not every state has a creative class. Yeah. So yeah. I guess you touched, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I love that. I think that's so, we've been um, latching on to that same narrative, Bob, here in Oklahoma you know, one, one of our state legislators actually, who's who's real a big advocate for film and music, especially music, Tulsa music. Um, you know, we were just brainstorming and she's like, film and, you know, films and, and music records. I mean, it's no different than um, a widget or, you know, a, a, a windmill blade or um, a, a car part that we're exporting. It's, it's actually, in, in my in my opinion, the products that that are being created for entertainment let's just say entertainment products those are renewable resources they're not drying up they're not blowing away <laughs> you know they they really are true renewable resources and so we're also leveraging and um, strategizing this session uh, here and now where we are now to include some NAICS codes to in, to include the entertainment sector here in Oklahoma with some of those uh, economic development incentives as well. So I think, you know, it's, but it's taken time and KJ to your point, your qu sort of question earlier, how did you get here from there? You have to build up the industry at some point. You have to have those years of, of building up the industry and trying a state a film incentive or a lot of people have tax credits. Ours is a cash rebate, but you have to have those years to build it up. And now I feel like, private sector is responding to that investment that the state of Oklahoma has made. And so people are building the brick and mortar. And that when you see, you look at Georgia, the permanent infrastructure 
that they've built, it's going to be really hard to, 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 um, you know, to, to take that out. It's, uh, it's important to have the, the brick and mortar. And you, you all know that when legislators go into a sound stage, it's a different feeling than going onto a set that's just there mm-hmm. for a few days. It's very different. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I was going to um, just touch on some of the things that you guys have done. Uh, some of the more specifics that some of our listeners might not know about is things that you've actually done specific initiative initiatives and our infrastructure projects. Um, and one of the one that caught my eye was the Tennessee scoring incentive program. And that seemed quite outside the box, but could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. I mean, All again, of you, but leading with Bob, but. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, you know, it, it's, again, it's part of the evolution. You know, we started with the visual content act of 2006. That's probably when we all got into the incentives game and we were doing film and, and television. Um, and that's what primarily the focus was. And then 2018, uh, we did the Modernization Act, um, the Visual Content Modernization Act, to help build in uh, music scoring and, um, and of course, uh, a video game development and AR, VR, and all of that into the grant program uh, and following in the footsteps of, of Texas. As a matter of fact, using a lot of, of the Texas economic uh, reports that were coming out to try and make my case. Um, since we both have grants, all three of us have grant um, systems, mm-hmm. by the way, um, so it tells you sort of the states that we come, come from are, are very similar fiscally, very similar um, um, states. But yeah, I mean, with the uh, with the music program, again, it was a matter of, hey, um, you have all of the components in place. Um, you know, you have this sort of cluster based, you know, economy around music and you don't have to put a lot of investment in it to make it grow. And that was, you know, one of the things that I, I led with was, listen, you know, we, we have a, a cluster here, um, you know, geographically, we have all these great assets. When you invest and when the state wants to invest in something, you don't necessarily go to the state and ask them to invest, you know, in something that there's nothing there and they got to build it up from the floor. If you ask them to put in an incentive and say, hey, we put 25 percent on this, we already have the competitive advantage. We already have all of the people in place to do this. Then all of a sudden um, and you're known for it. Right. I I don't even have to market it. I mean, we're already known for it. We already have all the ambassadors in place for it. And so it's like here it is. And um, and it's been very successful. I mean, we we brought in, you know, some great TV series from Netflix and well, from all the studios. We've gotten these great, you know, TV series scoring projects being done here. They're spending lots of money and our musicians who once weren't in the fold are now a part of it. And we're able to talk about it. And again, that adds to the conversation and narrative around the entertainment sector versus just mm-hmm. the filming sector. So it's been very successful for us, but you know, again, we just leveraged a, an economic based cluster that we already had here in the state. And, and how did you get that messaging out to people that might want to, that you, you know, you had a target market, you thought we could attract them. How did you get that messaging out to them? I mean, I, I mean, honestly, we already had people living here in the state that were, right. you know, going out to, um, you know, these, these composers. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I talked to some of the biggest composers in the industry just because they had friends that lived here in the state of Tennessee. And it was so easy because it was, hey, this is my friend. I've known them forever. Why don't you come to the state? Check out a few facilities. And it wasn't like putting film people from L.A. that never been to your state in the car and driving them around and trying to get them to emotionally move in, um, you know. All of a sudden you just have, you know, these friends of friends and you're just hanging out and you take them to Nashville and hey, Nashville's awesome and it's a cool place Um, and you have a good time and, you know, they love the atmosphere and the vibe. And so it was, uh, you know, and then you put a little money on top of it and it really uh, it really uh, makes it pop. Cool. I mean, I think one of the great things is we're we've got a South by Southwest audience, which is such a convergence of everything. And not only the established, but lots of rising talent. So I think this this is an opportunity for you guys to also just explain a little bit the detail about what some of these programs might be and attract. With the, the, Texas has the Media Production Development Zone program. Do you want to mm-hmm. tell us a bit about that, Stephanie? Sure. Um, to sort of give you a really short 
um, non-state government to answer. Is it the sales tax exemption for developing or um, refurbishing media production facilities? Um, so one of the things um, in this program was sort of, it came into existence about 10 years ago and then the rules were finally written and got updated and now we're starting to see it. Taven made the point earlier that um, you have to grow the industry and you have to sort of, um, you know, get people, not just the government doing things, but you have to get the, the actual business climate and the industry on board. And, and we're starting to see some really great returns um, with that program. Um, a lot of our gaming companies were sort of first on board because it meant that they were able to refurbish or add on to facilities that they already had in existence as those companies, those brick and mortar companies are growing. Mm -hmm. And now as the need for turnkey space um, in, in continues to increase, um, we're seeing sort of a new crop of people who want to build studio spaces all over the state. Um, sort of inquire and start to participate in the program. And we couldn't be more excited about that. We're also seeing in some of our other markets like Fort Worth, where they're starting to really grow and level up their creative class. So there's a lot of in independent production companies that are now sort of um, developing their own production facilities through this program. And it's been really great to see all the ways in which our industries can put this program to good use. And it's it's sort of a it's an interesting program because it's not just us saying yes you can have this sales tax exemption. Our um, our office works with the community partners and the municipality where these uh, projects want to um, create the media production zone, and it's sort of a coming together of municipal, state, and um, private sector business, and which is pretty cool. So um, that's, we're seeing, we're really trying to develop more of our partnership efforts. And, you know, incentives are important. They come up in almost every conversation that we have when projects want to come um, make their, um, pre when people want to come make their projects in Texas. And, and I'm, I'm not discrediting that, but there are, we're, we've been also trying to develop the other added value that we have in the state so yeah um, um yeah. yeah it's part of an ecosystem you need a place to do the business as well mm -hmm. so uh, Tava, i know that you've got um uh it's a additional two percent uh uplift for the use mm -hmm. of oklahoma music mm -hmm. it might be worth just explaining a what an uplift is for people that might not be familiar with it and then how that came to be and any any home runs you've hit out of that <laughs> Uh, yeah, we I think we've had a few home runs. Uh, so as I mentioned before, Oklahoma has a cash rebate program, but in, in, this will be our 20 years to run it. Um, we started with uh, with a lower a lower rebate and a percentage, but now again we're up to 35 percent, and that is a cash cash back on your qualified spend in Oklahoma. And then um, several years back, again, as I mentioned before, we just looked at our assets and said we need to uh, retain kind of what Bob was saying. We need to really also retain our talent here. And so one way that we can retain the talent is by incentivizing people to use them. Um, and so Rudderless was a really fantastic example. Uh, William H. Macy, his directorial debut uh, it uh, premiered at Sundance and it really was a great example of utilizing, you know, not only just recording in Oklahoma, but really putting a lot of our musicians on screen as well. And um, so that was a home run. Uh, Wildlife, which was Paul Dana's directorial debut. We have a lot of those for all of you uh, <laughs> young directors, uh, men and women out there. We would love to have you here. We're, we're definitely a hotbed for you uh we've we've uh, we've been seeing a lot of success in that independent film space still so we we really do love working with those independent filmmakers but paul dano actually is very very interesting that he unveiled some unrecorded bob dylan music sheet music that was uh in the archives that lives at the university of tulsa and they found that sheet music and recorded it 
And so they were able to to get the uptick of the 2% on top of their 35% for that movie that premiered at Sundance as well. Um, and most of the films, we had one this year called Wild Indian, um, utilized, most of the films are utilizing the 2%. So it's working. And as I mentioned earlier, those recording studios are now expanding because of that. Uh, they're expanding their their wings. You know, they have a new post arm here and and more and more business. And so uh, there's also the church studio, which was Leon Russell in Oklahoma. Uh, his uh, original studio from the 1970s, There, uh, there's a fine lady in Tulsa who's refurbishing that studio and it's going to be state of the art. So there's going to be more facilities and they're, they're just popping up more and more. So it's really important that we're retaining our talent, especially in times like now where people can go anywhere. People are realizing that they can work anywhere, <laughs> literally anywhere during this pandemic. And so we're seeing a lot of, a lot of people migrate back home to Oklahoma, uh, which we call them expats. That's another in, uh, incentive that we offer. Our, our film rebate program incentivizes former Oklahomans labor because we want them to come home. And that is really working well too. We have, uh, we host expat, we call them Okie Roundups in Los Angeles. We also now do them in Nashville. And, um, and it's important to let the former Oklahomans know that what's going on in their home state. And so we're trying to get them to come home. They're welcome here. Oh, oh, awesome. Um, yep. As you guys have evolved over the years, I know some of you have rebranded or sort of reframed, you know, your outward messaging to people. And I just I thought any of you want to just touch on um, what drove those decisions and how it's helped you to reach uh, a broader reach. Um, Bob, you, you, you shifted. We spoke about it a bit earlier, but you went to entertainment, which I thought was a much nicer umbrella to everything we do. Do you just want to talk about what drove that and the benefits? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think, you know, it just it just went back to trying to drive a broader a narrative into the entertainment sector. I mean, that's that's, you know, what we wanted to do, because, you know, now entertainment falls under, you know, the creative technology and music and, and film. And so there's there's just so much underneath that umbrella now. And again, it was really about trying to frame something up to our legislatures and frame something up to, you know, the governor and the administration and, and even the community. Um, you know, to make sure that they felt that they were, you know, being included in the conversation as well, not just film, but being able to, you know, go out and bring other people into the fold because, um, you know, uh, rebranding to entertainment, it, it did allow us to have these conversations with folks in the technology world that we mm. necessarily wouldn't have gotten the opportunity yeah. to, uh, to touch through our office. And, and what does that do? that informs our policy making. And I'm a firm believer of, of sort of uh, bottom up policy making. I, I don't like it when policy is created from the top down because it never works. Um, and so being able to have those touch points were very, very important to us um, as we sort of move forward with strategy. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I might we just didn't re oh, I just wanted to add, sorry, KJ. We didn't necessarily rebrand, um, but we did have something that really helps us sort of look at how policy gets made is in 2016, our office was moved from sort of a singular agency in the office of the governor to being under the economic development division. And um, one of the reasons I haven't been talking about music is I actually have, we have a, an office dedicated solely to music in Texas. So um, I don't want our musicians attending South by to think that Texas has forgotten about you. The Texas Music Office is our brother office and um, we collaborate with them quite frequently and are happy to do so. Um, but um, what they moved both of our offices, music and film under economic development. And with that, we sort of, we felt like we had the full weight of economic development, not only in the resources we were already providing, but the additional resources in terms of small business and technology sector and things like that. And it has really sort of um, changed our game, so to speak, over the last few years with our media production development program. Um, and then just sort of also working in concert with other economic um, development tools that are available um, in other sectors. 
um, we've really sort of been able to spread our wings. And I think that was a really smart move. Um, and I, I can, oh yeah. Go ahead. No, no, just when you're done. That's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our, mine's short, uh, basically very, very similar to Stephanie piggybacking on what she said. Our office has been historically under the Department of Tourism here in Oklahoma. And um, just in recent years, matter of fact, under new administration, when they said, Teva, you guys are rocking it. What, you know, what can we do to help? And I, I asked for two things, which was uh, move us under commerce because we are economic development <laughs> and, you know, ec uh, workforce development. And, um, and I think when when your industry starts to shift from just recruiting one project at a time to, you know, oh, we're talking to a company and they have a series, they have slates of pictures, like then the conversation shifts, right? And so now it's like, oh, well, if you need to be create doing seven movies a year, then we have facility, well, you know, we have sound stages, we have facilities now that you can move into brick and mortar. And so the conversation started to shift. But so there is legislation uh, that has been filed to pivot our office from tourism to the Department of Commerce. Um, and then the other thing that I asked uh, my leadership uh, for was just to go to Los Angeles with us and, you know, sh shake hands with, uh, with people that, that want to bring their business to Oklahoma and make sure that they know they're welcome. And so they've, they've done the, both of those things. So I guess I need to start, <laughs> need to think of what next, but yeah, um, no. So, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens as we, as we move over to commerce, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, well, so, so then all of a sudden COVID happened, right. And mm -hmm. we all have, really multifaceted jobs that touch a lot of different places. And like the rest of the world, you guys got hit with this curveball. And, you know, I know that here in New Zealand, people are going, well, what are you going to do to fix it? You know, and it's like, well, we don't have a magic wand, but I know you guys have all taken some really great steps and actions to help navigate this. And I'd just like for you to speak to that, please. Um, whoever wants to go first. I mean, I've got... Uh, one of the things that was the Texas, the open plan, open plan, open Texas. Texas. It's yeah. an open Texas media production checklist. Um, so we were one of the first states to open back up for production. Uh, we opened June 3rd um, this past summer. And what I did leading up to it, because I, I had no idea. I, I know that the way we sectors were opened in Texas and it might be different from state to state is that um you know our our we had a strike force. I got very familiar with the term strike force and it was um sort of um <clears throat> populated with industry professionals, doctors, everyone that had all the data that they were looking at daily to see like what how to safely and the um open all the different industry sectors that Texas um, supports. And so at any given day, we had no idea when we would be able to be open. And so what um, my staff and I started doing is we just really started talking to all of our industry members in all of our different sectors and getting an understanding of where they were at and what their organizations were doing um, in terms of planning. With a lot of phone calls, a lot of Zoom calls, like we're all on still, um, but just really trying to understand what people were planning for and then understanding what the state was doing in terms of mandating protocols or um, we call them minimum uh, standard health protocols for different um, industries returning. And so we help um, this, provide feedback and guidance to the strike force as they were creating our checklist um, in order to get us back up and running safely. And we actually opened earlier than we thought we would, which was a nice surprise because we had been <laughs> sort of um, managing expectations that we were going to open a little bit later and then we got to open early and it was just by pure luck so but you know we'll take that win 
Um, and then since then, we've stayed open, but there have been changes in gathering restrictions and both indoor and outdoor and and our different municipalities have different restrictions on top of the state. So it's really been a process of staying on top of all of that. Never in my life did I think that I would be, you know, <laughs> um, I would have a degree in film production and then get to also dabble in public health <laughs> um, information um, and things like that. It's been interesting and it's been really wonderful to sort of work with all of our different industry partners and stakeholders to sort of um, try to get everyone on the same page and work together safely. And um, I've been really proud of the way our Texas crews have done that. Um, uh, one of the things, you know, we, we did in our office is we found that we needed just to sort of make sure that, you know, it's really confusing and you get a lot of information from a lot of different sources. And so we started doing one-on-one -on -one safety consultations with projects when they're coming into the state or if it's a project that's already in state, but they're starting up. And we just check in with them and make sure they have as much information as they need, not only from the state, but we connect them to other resources so that they can feel a little bit more comfortable with how they're gonna move forward and navigate all this stuff because it changes. Sometimes I felt like it was changing minute by minute. Um, mm. Now, day by day. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. And um, Tava, we had spoke previously about a couple of things you had done in response to the pandemic. Do you want to just, we're just, we've got about eight minutes left. So we touch on that just briefly, because sure. I thought it was really interesting what you'd done. Sure. Yeah, uh, we 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 did prepare before our economy reopened June first, twenty twenty. Uh, our office did prepare and curate a considerations for filmmaking in Oklahoma document, which we made available. You know, you have to remember we're we're right to work state, so we've got a lot of non union crews as well as our growing union crew base, and so there was still a lot of production activity that was um, was starting to to still develop. So we put that document out, then the white paper was introduced, so we made sure that was in, you know, in front of everyone. But I think what really um, changed the landscape here was in July, we had a couple of major studios that were wanting to film here in the coming months, and <clears throat> we uh, sort of went together and uh, to Governor Kevin Stitt, who um, who deemed the motion picture and recording industries as essential business and uh, to advert any future you know shutdowns and so that was really a big game changer so in short in 2020 uh oklahoma's borders were open uh, as of june 1st our businesses were open we had uh, 35 film and television productions our first t real tv pilot uh with fx disney's where we were very thrilled and oklahoma made um, project and a lot of those were the indie films so we're very proud, like Stephanie, very, very proud of uh, the Oklahomans who were able to go back to work. They're still working. We have four in production now. Two of them are going to benefit from the snow coming uh, this spring. But, you know, you know, it's been wonderful to be able to have our doors open and put people back to work safely. And I could go on about all of the, the safety um, measures that we've put in place as well. But we've got a lot of a lot of support with the Oklahoma Health Department and labs and things like that in Oklahoma. So. We're open. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the underlying themes it feels like what all three of you are doing is that you're, you know, you're expanding some of your mid-market places to attract your people back home and give the people who are living there a lift up and give them actually, you know, real career choices in some industries that really didn't have paths for them before. You know, it was tough, tough. So um, just got a few minutes left and I guess really each of us tell us, you know, and say 90 minutes, uh, 90 seconds to our South by Southwest viewers, why they should come to your state. Go, Bob. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why? Well, thank you. I appreciate that, KJ. On the spot. No, um, you know, I think um, obviously the state of Tennessee, um, you know, it's uh, it's 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 a great business uh, climate here. Um, I think the quality of life here, uh, we have a very high quality of life. Um, and we also have a low barrier of entry here in our state. 
um, along with a, a very skilled workforce and uh, and, and, and a great uh, production vendor base here as well. And so, um, you know, you, you put all these, you know, things together and, um, you know, it becomes very attractive when you can go and you can live, you can do your craft. Um, you can not only survive, but you, you can su succeed. And, um, you know, I believe that Tennessee is one of those places um, that really gives people either starting in the industry, mid-career in their industry, or, um, you know, maybe changing um, a great place to go where they can meet people um, and evolve into who they want to be. Awesome. And they also have a trusted colleague now to contact which is yes. Bob Rains. You can find and me I think at tnentertainment.com. <laughs> what, what is it? tnentertainment.com. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it really is. People shouldn't underestimate the value of being able to call somebody like you with your connections. We'll shift over to Oklahoma. Why should, why should our viewers go to Oklahoma, Tava? <laughs> uh, well, we're open, as I just mentioned. Uh, we're, we have open, wide open spaces with 12 different eco regions. So we just had a commercial that um, literally shot uh, seven different states within our border. So that was exciting, Peterbilt. Um, but uh, we're like, like Tennessee and Texas, you know, the quality of life, the low, lower cost of living is, are definitely two um, top reasons to come here. And we're innovative. Uh, we're, we've definitely got that heartland hospitality edge where people, you know, want to welcome a business, any kind of business here. Um, but we're, we're a yes state and we're very, very innovative. And, and that is very, very evident by uh, the growth that we're seeing right now. So. And they, now they know who to call. And who to get yes, in touch with. you can find me at our, on our, through our website at okfilmmusic.org. Uh, again, Tavasovsky. Yeah, thank you for having That's, us. That is awesome. And now we'll just go back to the South by Southwest host nation is Texas. <laughs> why um, should we go to Texas, Stephanie? Sometimes I want to say, why wouldn't you come to Texas? <laughs> like, right? Um, no, I I think that. Kava and Bob talked about the selling points of their states, and I think Texas has a lot of similar qualities. We have a huge variety of geographical locations. I mean, we're they say everything's bigger in Texas. It's real big here, and we got a lot of different um, variety of things. So you can be um, at any given place. You can have snow or 75 degree weather or you name it. Um, and uh, I think our business climate is uh, pretty spectacular, and um, there's no state income tax, so just a little FYI. And um, I also think that our crews, um, you know, we have the hardest working crews around. Um, we they they have a lot of great experience, and they they've had a lot of great experience over a long time. And um, that is one of the best compliments I get when projects um, have wrapped and, you know, uh, check in and let us know of how just impressed they are by the level uh, of professionalism for our crews. Um, we also have so many different industry sectors here, um, music, AR, VR. You can sort of get everything you need in one state. and so. Again, why wouldn't you come to Texas? <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. Well, it's 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 been really fascinating, and one of the things that we as film commissioners all know is that the first fifteen minutes of any conversation when we meet somebody is explaining what a film commission is and does. So this has been an often so awesome sort of oversight, and it's it's really impressive what you guys have done. And we all get along, but we're all intensely proud of the places we represent. And that really comes through with you three. And, uh, you know, you guys are connected. That's, you know, you guys are so well connected to not only the industry and the community, but politically. Um, so I guess for those who haven't had an experience with a film commission before, don't be shy. It's not just for the big productions. You can see what we've talked about here. We welcome, you guys all welcome the new kids on the block because. That's where the future is coming from. 
And so that's really been really been great to spend time talking about this. Uh, I think one one of the things I tell people is, and they ask about film commissions, I go, twenty four hours a day somewhere in the world, a film commissioner is pulling off a miracle. And I think it just happens. We it, in our normal day to day, we just keep doing that. So. I'd like to thank all of you spend, spending time and look forward to seeing you next year in person at South by Southwest. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, KJ. Bye. Thanks, Stephanie. All right. Bye. Bye, y'all. See you, thank guys. You, Texas. Bye.